Please come into my room. <laughs> that is so trippy. That is where we learn the most. I am your host, David Ben, and you are now in the mustache room. I know it's been a minute since we recorded. However, we have this baby, and there have been some technical difficulties in the podcast studio, blah, blah, blah. Uh, nevertheless, we are here. We're resuming with a vengeance, and I'm glad you could be with us. On this episode, we talked to Anya Alexiak. She is co-owner, co-founder of the Psychedelic Society. Uh, they're based out of UK, a global organization, have almost a thousand members, and doing some really great things for gaining awareness and uh, just bettering communication surrounding psychedelics. I also bring back Wifey Jill. We talk about our Whole30 diet that we did for the entire month of January patting myself on the back. It allows you to set a baseline for the things that you eat and kind of figure out what might be causing inflammation. And it's actually a, a pretty good process. So we go into depth on that. We're also trying some culinary mushrooms here in the laboratory adjacent to the podcast studio. Please follow us online at mustache room, mustache room.com, M-U-S-T-A-S-H, uh, mustache brands.com. Great company that we work with our only sponsor. Thanks for being here. Enjoy. And now it's time for some education as my lovely wife, Jill, joins us to talk about mushrooms and health. You want my wisdom? Very wise woman. The latter part of last year, I kind of threw in the towel on uh, trying to be healthy and just... Well, ate. you weren't alone. Yeah. All right, so collectively... We were, we were festive. Let's just say that. The family as a whole, collectively decided to indulge. And we found ourselves in a situation where we kind of needed to clean it up. And so we decided to do a diet called Whole30. Yes, we did. And tomorrow is uh, the, the end of it. We're, we're done with it. I mean, essentially we're done oh, like we're, now because we're done with meals, right? We're done right now. It's, it's a glorious day. So Joe, yeah. why don't you tell, since you're more familiar with the diet and I'm just a, a newcomer, uh, why don't you tell the listeners like what Whole30 is? Yeah, so it's uh, an elimination diet where you basically get back down to the fund fundamentals of food. Um, so what is allowed are going to be meats, seafood. With the meats, you know, you want to make sure there's no additives, no preservatives, prioritize organic, farm-raised. Um, you're allowed to eat um, as much fruit and vegetables, uh, which some people might think, oh, well, fruit is sugar, but... This diet is really trying to promote, you know, back to the basics and wholesome foods. Um, so it's not a diet that promotes weight loss. Um, it, it's a diet that, you know, eliminates excess sugar, um, artificial sweeteners, preservatives, grains, legumes, like all the fun stuff, essentially. So no bread, no pasta, no rice. We can have as many potatoes as we want. The the thing about it for me, it... it you know, you can't eat peanuts when you said lagoons. Not everybody knows like what that is. Beans, peanuts, soybeans. I mean, so things that are just kind of common throughout most foods mm -hmm. suddenly become um, unfair game with the, the diet. Yeah. So soy and no dairy. Dairy was a big one, I think, yeah. that you don't realize how much you consume of those foods until you take them out. And the reason why they do eliminate a lot of those food groups um, is to promote... Um, you know, better digestion, the inflammation, you know, inflammation is a, a big cause of things. And with those food groups, there are a lot of them that do contribute to some sort of like side effects. So like, you know, bloating or inflammation. And so you're basically mentioned. you're stripping everything out that could potentially cause harm to your body, whether it be temporary or permanent allergies, anything that could, could cause your body discomfort or a, uh, a setback. They just kind of strip it out and have a baseline. Yeah. And the, the rules are pretty strict. I mean, if you mess up, if you have a cheat, then you start day one all over again. Damn. Um, it's like a AA coin. Yeah. It's, it's really, it it's think of it more of a, as a mindset cleanse. You know, we go into these autopilots with, you know, ordering takeout and eating what's convenient and, and just grabbing whatever is available. And, most of those products are going to be filled with crap, you know, things you can't pronounce. And when you 
go back down to, okay, well, I'm going to, we, I mean, how many times do we go grocery shopping? Well, I went grocery shopping. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're <laughs> cooking all day. The dishwasher is like nonstop running, but we're eating more wholesome foods. And I think you can attest to it. The cravings for those foods that we have enjoyed in the past, like the cravings are, aren't necessarily there. I mean, we long for them, but I think we've been feeling so well throughout the month. And, you know, it's something that I think we're going to still incorporate a good percentage of the time. Yeah. I mean, for me, I definitely knew sugar caused my body to kind of stiffen up and sometimes gluten, but, you know, stripping all that stuff out and really our own, only source of sweetness is date paste because dates. that is, <laughs> dates are like the, uh, the holy grail of, uh, it's the only sweetener that you have available in Whole30. You can get well, like mine fruit is like juice. Fruits. Or, I mean, yeah. But if, are sweet. But if you want to sparkle it up with some sugar-esque sort of flavor, you only have date paste at your disposal. So yes. we've, we've been making like cashew milk and... Oh, yeah. We make homemade homemade cashew milk and we make like little snacks and stuff here and there. Do you make dehydrated fruit? I know. I've taken it to another level. So, I mean, this has yielded some good things. And I think we'll we'll take a lot of this stuff and we'll we'll make sure it's a you know, a mainstay in our, our eating habits. But the bottom line for me is to strip all the stuff out. Once the diet's over tomorrow, I can start putting stuff back in and I can see, mm -hmm. Hey, if I put wheat back in or I put sugar or dairy or whatever, and I immediately have some sort of adverse reaction, whether it be just body discomfort, stomach discomfort, you know, tightness of muscles, whatever the case may be, then I know that there's a direct correlation between the way I feel and that particular type of food. So I can decide to say, fuck it, just suck it up and have pain if it's that good, like a milkshake or a pizza, or I can be like, hey, I'm going to save myself agony and lying fetal and lying in the fetal position um, and just forego this food altogether. Yeah. And I think that that's part of it is you know, resetting your body. It's a body reset, right? So as you do incorporate the foods that you once loved that, you know, you ate on the regular, you know, your body has been detoxed essentially. And when you add in, you know, let's say, well, um, we already know what would happen for you with a oh. milkshake, but oh, you know, boy. let's just say like, you know, a pasta and then all of a sudden you're feeling just sluggish and tired and fogginess, you know, that is, you're just going to ask yourself, was it worth it? Yeah. I mean, I'm in my mid forties now and I, I have to admit, um, it, I don't need any more aches. Right. So if there, if pasta is causing my body to ache, then I can't, it's like compound achiness. I, I just don't need any more achiness. So yeah, it's a good way it, to omit that one additional achiness from my repertoire. Yeah. And not to say we'll never have pasta, but you know, are the repercussions worth it? And there's plenty of substitutes. I mean, you might not have the exact dish, but, you know, there's other wholesome, you know, really enjoyable meals we can still have. Yeah. And I, I'll come right out and say that I think cauliflower as a substitute <laughs> for bread or whatever is horseshit. It just, they cauliflower bread. I don't know if that uh, I've heard of that one. Well, whatever. <laughs> like they have cauliflower pizza crust and other rice, horseshit. Cauliflower rice is it's the worst. Terrible. It's yeah. slimy and it is not the same. And it's watery and bland. Yeah. So if you can find a way to prepare cauliflower so that it doesn't suck in that capacity, like a rice substitute, I would love to know about it because we haven't figured out that magic formula yet. Yeah. I, I mean, gosh, I ate a lot of cauliflower rice in past whole thirties, but <sighs> I couldn't do it this time around. No, it's, it's not. I mean, I, I like cauliflower dipped in ranch or yes. mashed up as like a potato substitute, but yeah. not if it has its texture and like the construct and it just kind of gets to me. Ooh, remember that stuffed cauliflower I made for Christmas? That was really that good. That was really good. Right. So not all cauliflower is bad. I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to make that blanket statement. Um, but nonetheless, we've really enjoyed this whole 30 at first. It was tough just because you're, you know, you're used to just eating whatever and not having these really aggressive restrictions. But after a while you kind of lean into it and, um, I have felt really, really good over the course of the past few weeks. So thanks for that. Yeah, no, thanks for doing it with me. It was, um, it was nice to have a partner. Yeah. And they have certifications and stuff. It's very similar to the paleo and other stuff. So if you're interested and you want to get, 
um, you want to try it for a month or read up more about it, it's it's pretty popular. So it's called Whole30. Yeah, very popular. Tons of cookbooks, tons of certified um, products that you can find at the grocery store. So yeah, I'd say give it a shot. It's it's nice to um, break down if you've done any diets in the past, like low carb, back ends, keto, and you know, you ask yourself, is eliminating fruit and vegetables healthy? Like, I mean, if a diet tells you to not eat fruit or not eat vegetables, I'm sorry, that's not a that's not the diet for you. Like, the, let's get back down to the basics. Reintroduce whole foods to your body, and then you know you can you can kind of tailor that what you, what else you need to do if weight loss is your goal. For sure, yeah, it's a nice by, byproduct of the diet is weight loss. I mean, you know, when you're stripping not for out, everyone, but yes, it, it it should. Yeah, I would think you know you'd never want to suppress your level of activity. You know, you want to keep stay active and, you know, try to make sure your metabolism's working as best it can. But I think by eating really good foods, you can't help but be put in a good situation where you could potentially lose some weight. Yeah. <laughs> is, and that, I think, is that vague um, enough for you? It's that was that was vague. <laughs> right, you're um, welcome. Yeah, I just whole thirty is not again, it's not a weight loss diet to go on. It's they talk about off scale victories. You know, do you feel good? Do you wake up and you, are you making good decisions? Are you energized? Um, you know, what's what's your motivator? So, yes, weight loss does occur a lot of the time, but there's a lot of other areas that you can see improvement and still feel good about yourself. Cool. And to help along with our journey, we got one of those indoor hydroponic, aeroponic, vertical gardens, which yeah. is really awesome. It's G A R D Y N. It has 30 pods, self-watering, self-lighting. It's kind of a fully automated indoor badass garden. Yeah, no, that was a that was a great find. Yeah. It was, I think, Time Magazine's invention of the year or whatnot, but G-A-R-D-Y-N. Unofficial sponsor. We're just fans. It's done well <laughs> for us. And uh, so we'll just keep doing that. But yeah, if you're in a situation where, like in Denver, the climate is so volatile, it's hard to have stuff outside. And so it's a, it's a way to control all that um, in t- internally. Yeah. So yeah, the whole 30. I also wanted to talk about the Telluride Mushroom Festival is coming around in yeah. August. And what is it? February 1st they have? Well, so tomorrow. So tomorrow. by the time this is published, okay. you can purchase your tickets. Cool. So last year was a hoot. Uh, lots of great vendors there. Lots of mycology superstars, you know, all the different facets of mushrooms. We had a blast. Rashad Evans was there. UFC fighter. Yeah. Badass. But yeah, so uh, check out the website. I don't know who's on the, the docket this year. I think they announced um, when tickets go on sale. Okay. All right. So just keep posted. There's a Telluride Mushroom Festival website. So you can just do a search and you can find that. Jill, I also wanted to talk about our culinary mushrooms. Yeah. We have finally. <laughs> two culinary mushrooms that we're going to be experimenting with. Now, I, for the listeners, you know, I've talked about cultivating psychedelic mushrooms and that's been my, my wheelhouse to yeah. date. However, I definitely have become more uh, comfortable in the kitchen with certain things and contributing and trying to make sure that you have the right tools to create these amazing (laughs) dishes. So I have to venture into the culinary realm of mushrooms. So we're starting with two very popular mushrooms, the lion's mane mushroom and the pink oyster mushroom. Now the substrate, the the food that is going to be the initial base for uh, for growing the mushrooms is going to be a little different between those strains. Okay. So I was reading and we're going to use like wood chips and I believe some wheat bran for the lion's mane. Okay. And then we have to use hay or straw, like sterilized straw for okay. the oyster mushrooms. You know, just a pet store would have hay or straw. Oh, yeah. Get for a like couple hamsters. gerbils. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Give Becker her first, uh, yeah. first little pet. Yeah, no, I refuse to have <laughs> So yeah, there we go. That'll, if we get really up shit's creek, I think the hardware store, Ace Hardware, might have like a bale of hay. But you're not buying a whole bale. <laughs> I know. I, probably the pet store. Yeah, well. We'll, or well. online. To be continued. We'll have to get back to you guys and let you know how that goes. But So we're going to try these two mushrooms. I have all the same growing bags that I've been using for the, the rye and popcorn and stuff with the psilocybin. But um, we have to find a way to sterilize that hay once we get it. 
I think you can use hydrated lime or we can do like a heat sterilization process. Interesting. That'll be fun. But yeah, we'll get back to you guys. We have liquid culture that I got for just from Amazon for those two strains. And I'll just uh, put it in front of the flow hood and inoculate the shit out of them. And we'll see how it goes. And then how how many days, weeks, like start to finish, you think? Like if you if you do everything tomorrow, is it two months? It, like what do you think? Yeah, well, we'll be we'll be growing in the bag, right? So we won't okay. have to move from like a oh. from a casing yeah. phase to you know fruiting. So we'll do everything in those bags, and so I believe with the oyster mushrooms and with lion's mane, they grow outside the bag. Okay. So we'll have to create little slits for the mushrooms to expose themselves and start growing towards the light ah. source. <laughs> yeah, little pervy mushrooms. <laughs> 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 little trench coats. Well, that's like the flaps on the bag. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll have to get back to you. I don't know what the whole turnaround time is on these mushrooms. Again, okay. I'm going into this, not blindly, but without any real experience. So I'll have to provide you guys with some of the pitfalls. And, you know, I'll let, I'll let you know whether I feel it's comparable in terms of difficulty to the uh, psilocybin mushrooms or, you know, whether it's a piece of cake. But to be continued on that matter. Yeah, and um, what was I doing today when I was at Natural Grocers? They had beach mushrooms. What? Which we have not tried yet. Beach mushrooms. B so do they E C H. Okay. Do they resemble anything like um, any other kind of mushroom? So they're tiny clusters. They almost look like a gnocchi. Okay. But like bigger, and they're small, thin, with round tops. Um, they're known as beech because they grow off beech trees, so B-E-E-C-H. And there was like two little packets, and I think you just trim off the ends and saute them, so that will be coming on the next uh, episode. We'll talk about how that went. Beech mushroom. Stay beech tuned. Beech mushrooms, yeah. So just a little bit of uh, facts on them. So they are high in protein and fiber and low in fat. Good. Um, most mushrooms are low in fat until you add all the butter. Mm. Ghee, Don't which forget ghee that. is allowed on Whole30. All right, well, let, wait, let's, mm. di let's discuss that. Not many people like me personally until you welcome me into your healthy realm of you know cooking and stuff. I had no idea what ghee was. Um, yeah, ghee is essentially clarified butter. Um, it's very popular in India, um, in the Middle East, like over... <laughs> over there. Why is it more? Um, why is it acceptable in the whole thirty culture, as opposed to like regular butter? So ghee is so it's clarified. So it removes. So for people who have allergies or sensitivities to dairy, ghee is a better option. Okay. Because it removes, like the I don't want to say the impurities, but. Um, I got you. Anything that could be um, considered an allergen or spark somebody's immune system, or yeah. I'm so it, so it ass, removes no it idea. removes the milk solids. So it's more of like it's more of like that popcorn butter taste too. It's very buttery flavor. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't. It's cool that there is a butter that you could use that you know is clean or however you want to. Yeah, <laughs> and so it's it's butter, so it's, well, it's ghee, but it's rich in fat, um, has a high concentration of the healthy fats, um, so those are going to be monounsaturated omega-3s. Unsaturated fats help pull fat out of your blood and lower your cholesterol. So people think you eat fat, oh, you're going to get fat. But no, he there are healthy fats and unhealthy fats. Saturated is unhealthy, unsaturated are, are healthy ones. So you can reduce your cholesterol levels with ghee, um, you know, using that as you cook. And I thought it was interesting. It, it's in the pantry. It's not hard like the butter in the fridge because that's filled with a bunch of uh, like additives. It's got oils added and it's not like it's not real butter. Yeah, it's like a mushy candle wax kind of consistency on oh, the ghee. Yeah. But it's it like is a good. Rich yellow. We've been using it on all the potatoes we've been eating, lots and lots and lots of potatoes, because that's on the acceptable list. Yeah, and like people are scared of potatoes, and like a potato is 100 calories, and it has a ton of vitamins. They're fairly inexpensive, too. They're super inexpensive. Yeah, that's why unlimited fries, no big deal. Applebee's, bam, oh, yeah, whatever. They're, they're not losing any money no. with that. 
so yeah, it's been a, a new experience. The cashew milk as a substitute for milk, the ghee, mm-hmm. the date paste, learning all these things as alternatives. And like I said, I, I have felt really good. So no complaints. Now that I'm going to hop on, you know, hop on the exploratory train and start, you know, getting some of the, the variants back in my diet, we'll see if it hurts my body. We'll see what happens. Yeah. And if it's worth it. And if it's worth it. See if the juice is worth the squeeze. I'll tell you, um, the alcohol will always be worth it. <laughs> oh, yeah. No alcohol. All right. So the scotch and Montucky, let it flow. It's coming tomorrow. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks for being here, Booette. Appreciate thanks it. For, thanks for being my boo. And now my conversation with Anya Oleksiak of the Psychedelic Society. We are based in the UK. Uh, however, we have quite international reach. I would say 80% of our audience is British, but we have... Some folks in states and some folks even from Pakistan coming to our event. So it's, it's pretty international bunch that pops into to what we do. From the very beginning, we're quite close with US because we are co- we are working with co- in collaboration with MAPS, so Multidisciplinary right. Association for Psychedelic Studies. They are our fiscal sponsor, which means they accept donations on our behalf and. Uh, so that it can be deducted from tax. And also they are patrons of our project. And from the beginning, they were actually helping us a lot with guidance and connecting us with people. So psychedelics, obviously a broad spectrum of plant-based medicine. And um, is there one substance or one mechanism that you guys focus on more specifically um, to gain exposure or traction, or is it pretty much just the entire spectrum? Well, as a society, we're interested in all the spectrum, as well as not just substances, but practices that people use around psychedelics, uh, because we, we believe that psychedelic journey is just a start of, of a journey, actually. It's just gate opening moment when then you need to um, look into your self-care and self-compassion and, you know, looking after your health and, and all those things like meditation, yoga, embodiment, somatics. So we do that, but in, in the UK, overall, the biggest uh, focus is on psilocybin at the moment for mental health. And I think secondary uh, would ketamine is, actually there's a first ketamine clinic uh, th- with therapy in, in the UK as well. So that's also quite a big focus. And the third focus will be a bit of MDMA, but not as much as in the US. I know in the US MDMA is like, almost legalized now for medical. So we're far away from that one. Yeah, MAPS is definitely leading the way as far as MDMA. The psilocybin, I guess, you know, I know the legalities out here in the US and how some states are more progressive than others. Um, Ketamine is like a schedule three and readily available. Is it the same kind of thing in the UK uh, or are the rules a little different? It's the same with the ketamine. Uh, It's also schedule three here. Uh, the only thing about ketamine um, that's different than states is that so far we only had clinics so that give you ketamine but no therapy. So it's not ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. It's just an infusion and then you go home. It's not even high dose and gives this afterglow for months so people feel good after a month. And then they're forced to have a top-up, which as you can imagine is not the ideal solution. So... Uh, only now there's a first clinic in Bristol uh, that actually offers psychotherapy. But the mm-hmm. problem with that one, on the other hand, is that the prices are super high. It's it's like in thousands, so most people just cannot afford it, unfortunately. I know what the integration would look like for ayahuasca or psilocybin. What type of what type of integration would surround ketamine experiments or experiences, considering how it's you know a little bit more disassociative and and slightly different from some of the other psychedelics. Well, you know, yeah, it's a bit dissociative, but you still have some insights and stuff. People still have insights and uh, those need to be talked about. I'm not obviously a therapist, but you need a proper preparation, first of all, to, you know, you know, to know what they're expecting and have like this trust with the therapist before you can go very deep. And then you do still need to contextualize those insights somehow and ground them in reality, because otherwise they're just, you know, wishy-washy insights that you don't don't do anything with so have to talk them through because often you see those images that are quite mythological you know or outerworldly and you need to know maybe it's quite hard to contextualize it how to use this in your daily life so help of therapy or help of 
integration circles, uh, embodiment, you know, putting yourself back in the body, those definitely, especially with ketamine, who's, which is dissociative, then you need to be put back in the body. So I think those would be pretty much the same as for all psychedelics. I don't see the aftercare after ketamine being different than psilocybin, you know what I mean? It's, it's the same, it's the same um, kind of, it, it works the same way that you have this groundbreaking experience and then you just need to, you know, integrate it into your life. Speaking very easily, but obviously it's not easy to integrate those experiences sometimes. Sure. Yeah. Some, uh, one of our good friends of the podcast, he's been on several times. He went through a series of ketamine treatments. And like he said, they, it was very hands-off. You know, they gave you access to the facility and the medicine and that was it. That's a tough road unless you're really very familiar with yourself. Yeah, I think some people can do it, you know, the same way some people can um, trip on LSD on their own and have great results. But unfortunately, this is not uh, a rule. This is like just few people that can do it. So yeah, definitely we need a lot of support from others. Sure. How did you get started with the Psychedelic Society? How did you get involved? It's quite a, quite a long story because I suppose let's start with the fact that I was like in the height of my depression and, you know, I was feeling really bad in life and psychedelics kind of showed up in my life again because I knew them from before, but recreationally, but they opened that gate that I was talking about, you know, they opened the gate to healing and wanting self-compassion, self-love, wanting to feel better and stuff. And I was really inspired with this and then figured out that there's this whole research, you know, like I didn't know that there's research into it. It was not mainstream back then because it's quite a long time, quite a few years ago that was. And then I went to a conference breaking convention and I saw 2000 people that are into psychedelic research and I just lost my mind. I was like, whoa, I'm not alone. And was sitting on the grass at the break and looking at all those beautiful people and thinking I need to make a documentary about it. Then fortunately, I don't know my life. Always I find people who help me, met people from maps, that, that. I started meeting other people. And then Psychedelic Society, Stephen Reed, the founder of it, they needed, they needed a filmmaker. So Stephen Reed contacted me because he knew about my documentary. I was kind of the only one walking around with the camera and saying, I'm going to make a movie about it. You know, we didn't have all those movies yet. That was one of the definitely first one in the UK who started like, documenting this stuff and uh, they just asked me to join and I didn't think like I didn't even think I said yeah yeah sure I mean like it was a second and especially like he told me that society is a horizontal organization or at least aiming to be so no bosses you know everybody who's a core member is an owner and director and I was like this is this is the paradigm I want to work in so uh, now I don't know five years or four years later Never looked back. Best job I ever had. I love it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And I saw that um, with uh, it's Triptica Studios is is your that's the name of your um, your project or your organization. That's that's um, yeah. So it's kind of a sister organization to society because society mm -hmm. is more education and events. And Triptica is an ethical production company slash creative house. Uh, and we're dedicated to working with um, people in psychedelic space, but also any projects that um, improve well-being of humanity, you know, so mental health, environment, all those things that we're really social change, racial justice, all those things that we are, um, you know, um, interested in as, as humans. We also want to do films about it. So recently, oh, actually probably cannot have say, but because... Um, <laughs> of uh, the, you know, the non-disclosure agreement, but we worked, maybe I can say we worked recently where some really cool cannabis organization. So I can say that much. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's always cannabis psychedelics or mental health, basically, something like that. Cool, and I was really inspired to see one of the tenants of, of your project, of what you guys are trying to accomplish um, is uh, meditation, incorporating meditation into your practices. And that's one of the things that I always preach with, you know, my journey, my podcast, my associates and listen, listeners is, um, you know, getting control of your mind and really knowing how to navigate that space so that when you get hit with, you know, a big experience, psychedelic experience, 
you can navigate the space no matter how overwhelming. And so I guess, like, how do you see, do you see it fitting in the same way with your practice? Totally. Um, so first of all, like scientifically, we know that meditation and mindfulness uh, works on the same kind of systems because uh, the default uh, network, mode network. So we know there's already correlation there. And so it just makes sense they work as a preparation and integration of the experience. But I swear to you, I agree so much. If I didn't meditate for like at least, I think it was a year at least, like I did proper meditation before my strong experiences, I wouldn't survive mentally because I've done some really, you know, risky situations with psychedelics when retreats were not that common yet. It was quite hard to find one. And only meditation help me through it because there was no special guidance nobody to guide so i tell everyone before you go psychedelics you need to meditate at least for two months every day for at least five minutes or even two minutes <laughs> and just get the, you know, i think the whole thing with the breath being your anchor because when you're tripping and it's really bad let's say that's your anchor you just have the we always have the breath so that's always saved me out of any situation <laughs> fantastic yeah i'm a big uh, transcendental meditation proponent and you know everybody has their own flavor, but yeah, the uh, the preparatory aspect of meditation in terms of psychedelics, I feel it's invaluable. So I totally agree. Totally. I, I want to ask you um, the uh, what was it astral projection? I've never heard of astral projection. I know you're not. That's not maybe your core competency, but can you give me a, like a, a high level on what that entails? I'm not, yeah, this is not my pocket of the psychedelic society for sure. I'm the mental health science, you know, science, my religion kind of person. But uh, Amir is, my friend Amir does this uh, with Jade. And I'm not sure what it is, but it's like kind of having like, from what I understand, like having out of body experience. But when I think about it from like with my scientifically oriented mind, I can only think that somehow through training yourself you can reach in your head all those destinations that you've seen because like you can leave your body and travel in a city but i think that it's because you've been in the city and know those things in your head you know the map of it and when you train yourself somehow with meditation you can probably reach this during the dream and it feels like you're walking there but this is just my scientific guess you know i don't know if that's sure. true <laughs> All right, I'll have to do some more research and I'll follow up with the listeners. But yeah, it sounded fascinating. I, I've never heard of that before. Well, you should invite Jade, who's our facilitator in it. Uh, she's really good. She can explain a lot. <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah, I love, I, I just, I went through the website and I saw all the things you're, you guys are doing. And another cool thing is uh, the um, affiliation with Stripe Climate for carbon removal. Um, we, uh, we're 1% for the planet. So, you know, we work with them, but it looks like you guys, um, donate specifically to carbon removal. And I think that's fantastic. Yes, we do what we can. This is a new initiative that we started a few months ago. Which we're very happy we can uh, support this way. Uh, we are also very close with Extinction Rebellion. I'm sure you heard of Extinction Rebellion. No. Oh, they done no. a lot of pro protesting in whole of Europe. Uh, against climate, I mean, you know, about the climate change and to, um, so um, uh, Greta Thunberg, the, the climate activist, she's friends with uh, Extinction Rebellion and stuff. So they just like, they completely blocked whole London for, for, for a few days once, you know, just protesting and uh, they were all over news. So we are connected with them. Uh, a lot of people from that charity are part of our organization, some supporters or community. Um, we've given them space, all kinds of stuff. And we're also friends with um, Eco Restoration Camp, another charity. They go into lands that are completely dry without any green, nothing, you know, just sand almost. And they bring back natural habitat by replanting indigenous plants, Sometimes it's about bringing some animals there. So their job is just to take wasteland and make it beautiful green space again. So yeah, loads of env environmental stuff all the time that we do. That's awesome. And I, I want to make sure that people listening can um, affiliate themselves with the Psychedelic Society, become members, whether they be in the States or, or abroad. And I, I saw 
it was pretty cool the um the different memberships that you guys have uh, the Hoffman, the Sabina, and the McKenna. I definitely know where those teams come from, um, and I, I, I appreciate it. But if people want to become a member, um, it's eight dollars, fifteen dollars, or thirty dollars a month, based on you know the privileges that you get. Um, and so that that's really cool. Do you? Um, it says fifty nine patrons. Is that that's current the currently the membership uh, based on the website? What what, the, what does it say again on the website? Uh, it says it has the three members and it says 59 patrons. So I guess. Oh, I that's, that's... no, we have about 800 patrons at the moment. Oh, that's and awesome. We, if if the website is showing something else is because we were um, rebranding the website recently. So maybe there's some kind of a glitch. But thank you for uh, yeah saying this, plugging it up. We then we have around okay. 800 uh, supporters, supporting members right now. That's awesome. Yes, and like I said, Kevin 000, Matthews, for those listening. Okay. And 80,000 subscribers to email and 65,000 followers on Facebook. So it's, and it's just growing all the time. So it's an amazing big community. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, what a huge following. So yeah, that, that website is definitely misleading there with 59 patrons. Um, I uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the um, the psychedelic renaissance film. I saw that it's it's still in the works. What's your timeline for uh, for completing and publishing that? We really hope to publish it, have it done by end of summer this year. This is our goal. However, I, it's very hard for us because we're currently actually missing money for post-production. So just editing and animation and some sound work. So the whole film is shot, filmed, everything is done. It's just, we're, well, we need between 20 and $40,000 to finish, to finalize the film, which is not that much thinking of like, you know, usually you need much more because everybody agreed to work for ridiculous amounts of money. You know, we're talking hundred dollars per day when normally they take 600. So we have savings everywhere, but we do need that money. So we've been crowdfunding, but with COVID, we find it very hard. Also, you know, I run, to organize not-for-profit organization, and I'm doing this documentary, not-for-profit, so very limited time to also kind of put my own work and do the crowdfunding, because crowdfunding is like another job. It's it's, it's a heartbreaking <laughs> job, basically, crowdfunding. Um, but let's see, we're hoping that uh, by end of spring, we can get enough donations to film to finish the film in time, fingers crossed. That's great. If people want to donate that are listening, is there a, um, a crowdfunding link or something on the website? Yes, uh, there is definitely. You could just click support and then it leads uh, to another page where it says where our GoFundMe is, or it's just the Psychedelic Renaissance uh, on GoFundMe. Very easy to find us on Google as well. Great, great. I uh, I want to segue out of here because I know I only have you for 30 minutes, but um, I guess you know, one of the things here in the states you know all the different states have their own opinions of where we should go with psychedelics there are a few that are very liberal but it's it's really spread out i guess what do you think the next big step for us would be in trying to move this to the next phase i mean obviously gaining awareness with the films and you know all the things that are going on but like do you think there's really one piece of low-hanging fruit that we can just grab to propel us to the next level I think we're already there uh, with MAPS MDMA. What I would say, I would not rush it. Okay. Actually, I don't think there's sense rushing it. There's still a lot of things we don't know. There's still a lot of, in, in the research, we still need to figure out what is the best aftercare, you know? All those things are still not answered. So I was like, in the beginning, I was like, Let, let's rush it. Let's have it done as soon as possible. And now more I understand the whole field and more I speak with the therapists and researchers, I go like, let's take it slowly. You know, it will come when it comes. What we do need is a lot of education uh, about positive benefits, but also about negative, uh, you know, side effects that psychedelics have because there are negative side effects. And we need to show this really balanced view of them because right now I feel like it's going a bit too quick. It's like mainstreaming, everybody wants to take it. I get I get like few emails and messages a week, people begging me to help them with uh, psychedelics, you know, to find them or to go to retreat. Obviously I can't help with things like this, but I get asked all the time and it's a bit scary. 
So we need to carefully, slowly do it and be patient. And I think it's happening. Uh, I believe in the next five years, psilocybin will, will be legalized for medical use in UK for sure. And awesome. what in Canada is legalized for palliative care already. So I think we'll just see more and more of those happening. Uh, and yeah, loads of celebration moments for everyone in front of us now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the, um, the, we've had people on, you know, that have had their own takes on, you know, psychedelics and stuff. But it's great that, that you have a global movement. And it's great that the governments of the respective countries are, are getting behind it and at least acknowledging that it has uh, therapeutic benefits um, to the general population. So cool. Totally. Yeah. Is there anything, I'm gonna let you go, but is there anything else uh, that you wanna say um, to our listeners? Uh, this has been really fun for me, but anything uh, as, you, as we segue out of here? Just to follow the Psychedelic Society, check our events, because we do some crazily beautiful events. Um, we have a drug policy symposium coming up in April, which will be live streamed. We live stream all our, our um, in-person events. So just follow us and support us because any support, any ticket that is bought or any money that's donated, it's helping me to bring free education and free harm reduction resources to my community. So that's all. Just, yeah, talking people into supporting society. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'm so impressed with you and what you're doing, Anya, and I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to speak with us today. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me. It was lovely to chat with you and uh, good luck with your podcast. Walk with me, baby, come on and talk with me, talk with me, come on and take me down.